Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tom Collins, the Neubauer Family Executive Director and President of the Barnes Foundation. I am pleased, as always, to welcome you this evening to a little celebration for our newest publication, Cezanne in the Barnes Foundation, a landmark volume that was edited by Andre Dombrovsky, Associate Professor of 19th Century European Art at the University of Pennsylvania, Nancy Ierson, our Deputy Director for Collections and Exhibitions and Gunn Family Chief Curator, and from Paris, many of you will remember, I hope very fondly, uh, Sylvie Patry, who was uh, with us for three years before assuming the role of chief curator at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. So it's thrilling to have Sylvie back as well. Welcome back. Uh, before we begin our conversation, a bit of background. The Barnes is, as many of you may know, home to the single largest group of Cezannes in the world, 61 oil paintings and eight works on paper, a collection that spans every stage of the artist's career and includes iconic pictures like the card players and the large bathers. As you may also know, access to this collection was very much restricted during Dr. Barnes' lifetime, and the works in the galleries therefore went largely unstudied. Cezanne and the Barnes Foundation is the first publication to present our Cezanne holdings in their entirety, and like our volumes on American art, on Renoir, African art, and Matisse, it represents our commitment to advancing progressive scholarship on the collection. This new volume is born of many years of research and collaboration with colleagues from around the world. It contains entries by renowned scholars on every one of these paintings and works on paper, essays about Dr. Barnes collecting and writing on Cezanne, and findings from the technical study of key paintings by our own staff conservators, Barbara Buckley and Anya Shutov, that illuminate Cezanne's working methods. And I would say that this marriage of art historical and conservation research is, I think, one of the most exciting aspects of this publication. We are grateful to all of the authors who contributed their time and expertise, and to our director of publications, David Updike, for steering this complicated project to completion. I also wanna pay special tribute to someone who was Integral to the success of this volume, our dear friend Joe Rischel, former curator of European painting and sculpture before 1900 at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, who agreed to work with us on this project five years ago. Joe passed away just about this time last year, and those of us that were close to him miss him very dearly, and hope that in bringing this project to completion, we commemorate our collaboration and recognize all that he did to advance Cezanne's studies through his exhibitions and scholarship. And when you have a chance to peruse the book, you will note that it is dedicated to Joe Rischel. Cezanne and the Barnes Foundation is made possible through the generous support of Aquavella Galleries, John Alchin and Hal Marriott, Edward and Glenda Asplund, Lois and Julian Brodsky, the Leslie Miller and Richard Worley Foundation, Catherine Sachs, Joanne Thalheimer, Margaret and Tom Whitford, the Honorable Constance H. Williams and Dr. Sankey V. Williams, Robert and Wilson and Michelle Plant, and other individual donors. All of the publications at the Barnes are supported with the generous grant from the Lois and Julian Brodsky Publications Fund. And now I'm going to hand things over to our speakers. We are very fortunate to have the volume editors, Andre Dombrovsky, Nancy Ierson and Sylvie Patry here with us today, and we are very much honored to welcome Jody Hauptmann, who is Senior Curator in the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Museum of Modern Art, and Jody will be moderating for us this weekend. It's lovely to see you. Uh, Jody and I were, were colleagues many years ago uh, at the Museum of Modern Art, and she is a rocket ship in the field. If you have not had the opportunity uh, to peruse the catalog from her exhibition, most recently Cezanne Drawing, I, I can't recommend it enough. It won rave reviews and represents a truly critical contribution to the field. So she is a wonderful moderator for us to have this evening. So Jody, thank you for being here as well. And with that, uh, I'll ask you to join me in welcoming all of our speakers. Thank you so much from that more than uh, generous introduction. It's such a pleasure as always to be here at the Barnes. And I'm, I'm especially delighted to be here tonight 
to, to celebrate the publication of this really epic book and with colleagues, art historians, curators who I so admire. Um, so just really a, a pleasure for me um, all around. Um, the publication is a, a truly exciting moment for all of us who, who love the Barnes, and I think all of you here um, are in that group, making this collection available to anyone interested in Cezanne and really with enormous resident, resonance and reverberations in the field of art history and conservation. So um, uh, it's just gonna spark so much. So that's really, I think, an exciting part of it. So as a plan for this evening, I'm going to get things started asking um, my esteemed colleagues um, a few questions for the first part of our evening, um, about an hour, and then we'll turn to questions from all of you and also to those who are watching um, this virtually so you can participate as well. Um, so as a start, before we get to the book, I wanted to ask um, who was Paul Cezanne at the times Barnes built uh, this collection? Who was Paul Cezanne for Dr. Barnes? And I want to turn to Sylvie to start us off. Thank you, Jody. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so when Barnes started to be interested in Cezanne, it was in 1912. He made his first purchases at this, um, uh, this year. Uh, so Cezanne was already uh, died. I mean, he died in 1906. And uh, I would say that uh, Cezanne at the time was starting to be famous and recognized by artists and collectors. But, um, um, and Barnes belongs to this generation of collectors who really um, uh, built uh, a modern collection based on Cezanne, but uh, it was quite new. I mean, Cezanne during his lifetime uh, had a very few group, uh, a very intimate, I would say, restricted group of collectors. So there was a first wave of really uh, uh, avant-garde and avant-garde collectors. Then a second wave uh, starting from 1895 when uh, a dealer in Paris, uh, Ambroise Vollard, organized a first um, solo show uh, dedicated to Cézanne and really uh, it, made, uh, it was a shift in his career. Um, so this was the second wave of collecting in a way, and especially, I mean, uh, Cezanne was really uh, sought after by young generation artists, uh, artists such as Picasso, uh, Matisse, etc. Uh, really um, discovered Cezanne at the time. So when Dr. Barnes uh, started to be interested in 1912, it's, you know, the third wave of collector, and he was able to benefit from a large, a large amount of works that were on the art market, especially in Paris, because since Cezanne uh, has sold very few pictures during his lifetime, I mean, there were many, many works available uh, on the market at the time. And the first generation of collectors died, so there were big sales. Uh, so, um, uh, Barnes started, you know, in this uh, context in Paris. And he recognized pretty quickly that of the importance or the, um, uh, the experimentation, or what, what was it that... Hello? Is that better? Sorry. So, what I was saying is, um, um, I'm trying to understand what what Barnes saw in Cezanne, why he wanted to take advantage so immediately um, to those available works. Anyone? <laughs> okay, I, I'll take it. Um, uh, thank you, Jody. Um, and thank you. It's so nice to see Sylvie again after this season and be on the stage with Nancy. So, so welcome, everyone. Um, I, I think Dr. Barnes had a, a very particular version of what modernism and modernist painting uh, is, that it is uh, a, f a way to give life to form itself, to, to make form alive in painting. And, and he understood full well by, 19, uh, by 1910 and the first years of the teens that there are different versions of that. And one of them is the, uh, is, is the sensualist version. And that's why he liked Renoir and Matisse and, uh, and, uh, and, and that aspect of bringing life into painting through a, a sense of sensual pleasure, erotic pleasure. And then there's the more cerebral version, the, the Cezannean version, where uh, we are uh, looking at the world just as intimately and directly 
quickly as those other painters, but uh, we are uh, we are arriving at a more structural, fundamental uh, account of uh, uh, of of the picture and of the world in turn. So I think he he liked that combination. He he wanted to bring both of those tendencies uh, in equal, almost equal measure onto onto the walls of uh, uh, of his foundation eventually. So I think Cezanne came to stand for for that. Uh, material investigation that's very thoughtful um, uh, and, 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 and structural and structuralist in, in a way. And, um, uh, and, and so he, he bought Cezanne accordingly, I think, and, and it's very much a Cezanne that's starting to emerge in, 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 those, in those years as well, where Emile Bernard makes similar arguments, Maurice Denis, the, the, the symbolist critics are developing a language to describe that aspect of Cezanne's. That doesn't mean that there are still plenty of critics around who say, oh my God, what is this? This is all uh, a big mess and chaotic and we can't see anything. You know, there's just endlessly misplaced brush marks. Those critics are still there as well um, by the teens. But, um, but those other voices are starting to uh, be anthologized, be heard more loudly. And, and so Barnes is at, at that moment when that happens right there and, and um, uh, selecting among the best things there are. And what did it, um, uh, one of the things that the book uh, brings up is the way that Barnes really uh, collected with exhibition in mind, with display in mind. And can, can you uh, talk about that? Maybe Nancy, uh, take up that question. <laughs> For sure. What, what does it mean to collect that way? Well, I think it, collecting that way really tells you a lot about Barnes as um, as an individual and how I think it really gives us a sense of, um, you know, theme, uh, social meaning, everything else being secondary to Barnes's overall vision. And you still see that in our galleries today. Um, you know, for instance, we know that he was less keen on still lives than he was on landscapes. And, you know, the galleries again tell us that there's something about format. You know, he clearly likes that sort of straight linearity. Um, they are filling a purpose that is more than, than the artist's um, desires, if you like, or the artist's intentions. I think to, um, you know, with that question, uh, who, was, who was Cezanne for Barnes? I quite like to think this as a, you know, Cezanne was progressive for an audience in 1912. You know, Barnes isn't the first American to buy Cezanne, um, but he's certainly amongst the first. And if you think of what else is being made in 1912, you know, this is, uh, if you were in Paris and you really had your finger on the pulse, you would have been, you know, seeing, seeing Cubist pictures. Um, you know, Barnes is not cutting edge, but he's still, um, you know, very forward thinking, um, but he is, you know, as I say, you've got to put those kind of caveats in there. So, so knowing all of that and, um, you know, with, with that kind of background that you all have in Barnes collecting and what his ambitions were um, and what the display um, looked, looked like or what he hoped to display, um, I'm just thinking about this fantastic volume, and maybe Andre can hold it up to give you a sense of the heft of this thing. I mean, it's can just, I, can I though? it's you just, know? exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just, um, for those of you, you know, I'm not, for those of you who've actually seen it, um, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but for those who haven't, it is an, just an absolutely fantastic mix of deep dives into individual works essays that take up thematic categories, conservation studies, documentation, a, um, a, a chronology, long form overviews of Barnes collecting and scholarship, and then a kind of a, addendum with all of the catalog in, information. So this thing is just, I, I mean, astounding. And so I couldn't help but wonder as I looked at it, uh, what was your approach? How did you, I mean, this is a massive collection of things. How did you, um, how did you decide what to do? How did you, you know, what was your, what was your strategy here? Um, and Sylvie, you want to start with that? Maybe I can start. I mean, I don't know if it was a strategy, but I think that's uh, what we wanted from the very beginning. And uh, to mention earlier, the marriage, the marriage between curators, art historians, and conservators. We wanted really something uh, really object-based 
because we had this possibility to really look very closely at the works. And uh, what, what we did was really to, um, uh, to mix conservation and conversation. I mean, when I was typing my notes, I mean, I, I made a mistake and I, instead of writing conservation lab, I, I, I wrote uh, uh, conversation lab because what we wanted to do is really to bring. So, uh, we had a kind of uh, ritual every Tuesday when I was at the Barnes and Joe Richard would come every Tuesday afternoon. We would uh, bring a painting in the lab with uh, Anya, with Barbara, and then we invited the author of the catalogue just to look very closely at the work. Uh, so the first phase was really a visual examination and a discussion. And then there was a ph phase two, sequence number two, with Anya and Barbara uh, uh, looking um, also uh, very closely to the, uh, the works, but also um, making some technical investigations. So we really wanted, you know, this um, to anchor the project uh, in the object because it's a catalogue resonate, it's a catalogue of of a collection, so of you know uh, material which is uh, available. Yeah, I think that's a that's a wonderful description of how how this got off the ground, and then um, uh, eventually, I think it became important for all of us that uh, that this is also a very readable book, um, because when when you are I don't know how many catalog resumes any of you have read from uh, uh, from page one to page four hundred and thirty nine, um, I, I my I, I'm, my money is on not very many. So um, so we 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 were invested in. Um, in, in uh, bringing uh, the, the, a group of the main Cezanne scholars together and, and giving them the task to sometimes write on a single object, sometimes on a group of objects, in part because we wanted to have the entries read a little bit more essay-like, to have essays at the beginning, to have the con conservation, I'm, I always said conversation, um, uh, uh, also very readable. So that, I think that very quickly became uh, also uh, an, a topic of discussion amongst us that uh, how do we get a catalog resume into book form and into readable book form and that was one way for us to do that to sort of group things to uh, to give the essays to a very different kind of scholars more established scholars and and some very young scholars like Fabienne Ruppen who uh, is participating received her PhD just a few years ago um, and and just bring a variety of perspectives on this material uh, and and a variety of, of voices so um, uh, I think those were our starting points yes. I think that this was very much at the heart of the project. I mean, Nancy explained earlier that it's a very formalist approach from Barnes viewpoint. And what we wanted to bring in the book is really, you know, to broaden uh, really uh, the approach uh, to Cezanne, uh, especially, I would say, in this uh, specific context of the bands, uh, you know, collecting. So having uh, scholars who are in more, much more interested in, I don't know, uh, social history, cultural history. Uh, I mean, every every kind of approach uh, that uh, you cannot, you know, experiment at the bands when you visit the collection. So the book is really, uh, was really designed and conceived as a, you know, uh, to shed new light and as a complement to the display in a way. And just to push that a little bit further, um, how how did some of the results, so the essays and what what people learned from studying the works, either follow um, what Barnes had shared earlier or depart from it? And also, I, mean, I think related, I'm curious about how, what it means to work on a collection. You know, when when we do an exhibition, often we can go out and get, you know. It, any work that we want in a way and put together a story from works from a, a you know a whole the a whole global world of collections but here you're you're in a sense bounded even though there's this is an, enor an enormous collection like how did those boundaries also impact like did the collection tell you something about an individual work and did the individual work tell you something about the collection i think that the one of the interesting things with a collection and and in particular the Barnes collection is that this process I, I think for everybody involved makes you realize how much we learn about works of art 
through the exhibition process. Ordinarily, if you are a museum that lends its works, you send a piece out and you have colleagues in an institution like, for instance, MoMA. You know, all of these wonderful Cezanne drawings went to MoMA and Jody thought about them and wrote about them and people saw them because they were in another publication. So you find that your colleagues in the field are doing that work for you. That didn't happen with the Barnes collection. Uh, you know, as, as many of you in this room know, because you're such good friends of the Barnes, uh, the collection didn't travel, access was restricted. That process of seeing, learning, looking, and even seeing a picture under different lighting, you know, all in concert with comparable works. The catalogue that, um, that Sylvie began um, and that we've all sort of, you know, pulled together to produce um, really gave the opportunity to liberate those works and to have them, them, them breathe individually, you know, actually pull each piece out, uh, explore it, um, see it as a standalone work, and then actually try and tease out the relationships that those pieces have with other pieces that that they'll, they've never been seen with. Um, you know, that's, that was the really wonderful opportunity that this book offered. I was interested to that point of the groupings, like um, the different um, kind of thematic categories, like the corner, or, um, you know, they were just very evocative titles. Maybe you could say a little bit more about that too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I mean, yes, it's something we, we we did, uh, it was in the summer of 20, I don't know, 15 or something like that. I remember with Andre, yes, making these groupings and we wanted, I mean, to have, you know, some visual or and quite unexpected categories such as corners or, as you said, or tables and things like that, but also more, you know, uh, traditional uh, categories such as bathers or still life. I think maybe for us it was also, um, um, a way to um, to escape from you know the very strict frame of the collection and to really to open the windows and to 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 yes to to have more freedom to operate and to yeah I I agree I think for for us it was important to to mix this up a little bit and 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 there are a variety of ways to to do that in in part what became clear to me uh working on this for for these five six years is how and this is true for any body of scholarly knowledge right how how much it can uh, repeat itself can can become a, a bit of an entrenched form of speech and discourse and and so i think we just wanted to uh, assign authors uh, topics where we weren't exactly sure what exactly they would come up with uh, and the results were, were pretty much uh, entirely fantastic and um, and and so we I think we what we wanted to do was engineer some of those surprises into being uh, and I think that that worked quite well for for me at the end of this what was maybe the one of the bigger surprises was actually to learn a lot more about not just about Barnes as a collector, but also as a thinker and a writer. And it's actually a lot more uh, complicated and evocative itself than um, than than what I had thought was there before I actually uh, took a closer look. And uh, his language itself, when he writes about Cezanne, is is full of metaphors that are. Uh, quite astonishing in many ways right? to, to talk about the card players as as mountains or I think at some point he calls them a fortress or something you know and so just the the um, uh, the, the whole panoply of, of things he has to say about these pictures is is quite something and there is an essay in the book by John Elderfield that that brings many of these issues to to the force so um, so I think it was important to us to to invent a framework that was open enough to make some of these surprising readings um, uh, possible. And, and, um, I, and I hope we've, we've, we've gotten some way towards that. I have a question in mind, but I just want to follow up on something you said about how the language that Barnes used to describe Cezanne's. And I'm, I, I was um, had the chance to be in the galleries a little bit before um, this evening. And I always find when I'm here that I want to try to break the code and figure out why the card players are, are, are 
um, below this, the, the, the big Surah models or you know why one thing is next to another. And I'm wondering whether that language gave you any kind of clue or key to what we see when we're in those galleries. <laughs> well, don't, don't all jump at once. <laughs> well, I think, you know, um, definitely, you know, anybody that's taken a Barnes class or has sort of, you know, thought about the Barnes method will, will start to have some ideas about this. Um, but as much as you think, well, when we see uh, something like the card players in the, in gallery one, um, and we, it reiterates the balance of that work, you know, we, we see qualities in Cezanne that sometimes uh, we might miss in another context. So I think some of that is is there, but but also, um, and I don't think Barnes would thank us for saying it, but like, like Barnes uh, himself um, and his contradictions, I think that the hang also helps us to see Cezanne's contradictions. Um, that they, you know, these things do not operate uniformly. Um, the still lives uh, throw things out. You know, they they aren't very. Cezanne's aren't always well behaved in the ensembles, um, and so I think there is that wonderful tension. Um, and and there is, you know, for all the theorizing, for all the times we can see, well, there's this sort of rhyme between this color or this shape across the rooms. Uh, there's always something that's elusive. You know, there's always that extra guessing, and and maybe that is the perhaps that is the rationale, that it just keeps us looking and it keeps us guessing. Um, but I agree, I agree, I do often wonder why the poseurs is above the, is above the card players. <laughs> one, of, one of the many questions. Um, one of the pleasures, I think, of, of reading um, the texts um, in, the, in the catalog is um, this kind of weaving back and forth between us looking at the object and trying to understand it, but also hearing the story of how it was collected. And so um, and that's included in almost, um, you know, almost all of the essays, it's acquisition story. Um, and so I'm wondering about that, you know, in terms of that's not typical for a catalog resume to go in, into that at each moment and, and really give us the texture of that, um, of that purchase or the chase. And so I, I'm hoping that yeah, maybe Sylvie, you could speak to that um, as part of this um, this project. I mean, it, yes, it was very much part of the project because I mean, to to me, I mean, it's a kind of uh, the, the book and the collection is really an enc an encounter between an artist and a collector and a vision. I mean, the book is not about Cezanne; it's about Cezanne at the Barnes. Uh, so it's really a vision which was. Uh, very much, you know, oriented uh, to uh, Cezanne. And uh, in addition, I would say that there is, I mean, the Barnes has uh, uh, many, many resources, and it's not, you know, uh, always the case when you work on a collector, uh, because we, we have kept, I mean, the Barnes has all the archives, so you are really able to tell the story. And it's so fascinating to see, because it's really the beginning of the the, the 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 art market for modern art so you can learn a lot about of course Barnes and his ta taste and what he wanted to to buy what he missed uh, uh, I mean there were many missed opportunities and what what he was able to uh, resell I mean because he refined the collection so it's not uh, like if he started in 1912 and then uh, stopped uh, in the 1920 in the 1930s I mean sometimes he hesitated on some paintings he, I mean, he was looking for some works for uh, many, many years. So there is really a good story to be told. And I would say that it's really a part of the project because we need, I mean, it's uh, also a question of, um, you know, um, being aware of the material you are uh, looking at. I mean, it's assembled by a collector in a given uh, historical context uh, with, uh, you know, choices, but also a part of chance, I mean when a work is available or when a work is not available. So it tells a lot about Cezanne, but it tells a lot about, you know, uh, history of, you know, uh, how you look at art in a way. Yeah, that, that's very true. And just to give, give one very concrete example, 
the the card players that Nancy and I uh, worked on. You know, there there are there's probably a, almost two pages of, uh, of of acquisition history because, uh, it, it and it reads like a uh, it, it has novelistic um, uh, uh, overtones because uh, Barnes tries to buy a card player's painting for six years, uh, makes Vollard various offers. The kind of you know. The kind of offers that are you know, like you scribble something on a piece of paper, you push it over to the other side, and they're looking at it, and they're like, no. Um, and, and so Vollard uh, refuses the sale a couple of times, um, uh, and, and uh, this goes back and forth for years. Um, and and we have all those numbers, right? And so we know how much he offered for the first time. Then we know how much he offered two years later, which was a little bit more. Then the price goes down again. Then it goes up again. And eventually, he actually gets it, I think, even for a little bit less than what he initially offered six years earlier. And and um, and we have a sense of what he eventually paid, right? And the, and the equivalent of $1.5 million in today's money for the card players, right? If I remember roughly. You know? So, um, so and, and I cannot imagine that many circumstances in early modernist collecting where we have this information to this kind of detail and back and forth. And, um, and it's, it, it just painted for me a much more vivid picture of the, of the labor of collecting you know, and, and, the, uh, and the really the business finesse of it all, which, um, which was in many ways fun to tell, but also um, um, just very, very illuminating about, uh, uh, about the art market 100 years ago. Even, even um, there was a, a moment where he has to um, acquire more than what he wants in order to get the things that, uh, that he actually is, has, has focused on. So, and, and then the things come in and he's a little on the fence about it. So um, even that, that kind of level of texture and um, the chase is really fascinating. Cindy Kang, who, as again, many of you know, our associate curator, um, did a really wonderful job of writing an essay on, on Barnes collecting Cezanne, and I would just encourage you to read it because because it's a great story. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really does have that very compelling drive. And I think it's a nice consideration to, um, if you're not an art historian, to understand how you kind of get gripped by something, um, and that drives your writing process as well. Like, it's such a it's a wonderful story to unpack. And I think that, you know, Barnes is such an engaging figure. Um, really, he is fascinating. And so we also found, you know, in this book, this, to Sylvie's point, it's Cezanne, you know, in the Barnes Foundation. It helps to, to really kind of bring out that, that very particular aspect. I'm interested, um, Nancy, that you brought up uh, writing and writing these essays, I guess both both of you, Andre too. And um, you're very honest in the introduction uh, to the catalog about how difficult it is to write about Cezanne. And that's something I've experienced myself. So I'm kind of with you all on that. But I'm just wondering about that the, the, the idea of difficulty that we often hear about with Cezanne and how does it, um, how did that impact um, your take on these works, your take on the 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 the, um, the history of the works. How, how did you how do you wrestle with that difficulty? Anybody want to want to take that up? <laughs> yeah, Jody, such such a nice question. And, and so yes, I and in one a moment in the introduction, the three of us sort of say. Oh, this there, there's a difficulty here to be overcome that is just um, intrinsic into this in this project, right? And the, and and for me, the 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 difficulty writing about it is that that whenever you try to pin a word or a sentence on something, it will never quite get the gesture of Cezanne right because Cezanne's gestures are always doubled and uh, they are. Uh, speaking about the world out there and the the atmospheric effect out there at the same time that they are a brush mark and and no sentence right no string of words is ever going to uh, exactly get all that endless doubling and 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 um, uh, bifurcation in Cezanne right um, but once you've once you are, once you have acknowledged that to yourself, you know, then, then uh, at least you can pull it into two sentences behind one another, or into two paragraphs, and and start that 
kind of back and forth. So that's that's my way of, of writing beyond or through that um, uh, that uh, that impasse. I'll also say, you know, that that gesture has become a little bit of a cliche in Cezanne studies. This goes back to a famous sentence that T.J. Clark wrote. Uh, I think maybe even in response to the Card Players exhibition. I'm trying to remember where <laughs> where where I think he writes a review for the London Review of Books, and it starts with the sentence like. Cezanne cannot be written about any longer, period. <laughs> um, uh, he had something very particular in mind, but um, as uh, 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 social media and the internet does, you know, it likes to take a sentence and spin it out of control. And, and that sort of happened with it a little bit, right? And, um, and, and so now we're at a moment where, where, where we're figuring out, you know, what, what, what can we say, right? How can this complexity actually be translated into, um, into words? And I think there are just, there's not one strategy in how to do this, but there are 15 strategies of how to do that in this book. And, and I think that's the, um, that's the payoff um, for me um, of, of reading it collectively. Did either of you have a, have a strategy that you use to kind of, <laughs> um, Start start making some, pro, you know, um, progress with the blank screen, or the blank legal pad. Um, well, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Jodie, because I know that Andre and I and Sylvie have, you know, battled these things around <laughs> in our heads. Um, I think here yeah, too, and that you're right that that review was about the card players. Not that I take my reviews too personally, <laughs> but, but the, uh, but I do think it's not to be. To, to be defeated by that, actually, to find the energy to actually say, well, well, no, you know, not everything has been said. And actually, one of the purposes of doing a book like this is to make sure that people keep reading about the artist and being introduced to the artist. And you know, who knows where those new perspectives are going to come from? This is this is not the last word. And I think that's that's kind of the wonder of it, really. Um, so that kind of that's also a liberation, I think. But, um, but as I say, it would be lovely to, yes, Sylvie and Jodie, to, to hear from you. Okay, I mean, it's, uh, so I don't have any strategy to, <laughs> to write on Cezanne. And I, and I mean, to, to, to my eyes, I mean, it's, it, it's still a very demanding artist and it's, uh, it's very imposing. Uh, so I think that when you write on Cezanne, you have to, you, you have the feeling that you, you have to live it up to his, you know, uh, quest to his um, yes his, uh, his honesty and his complex research so it's a uh, yes I mean I, I find him always uh, really imposing and impressive so I admire you because you've written extensively on Cezanne which is not my case I just wrote for this catalog but uh, yes it's uh, but maybe I mean, you're right just uh, having in mind that it's not the last word and that uh, I mean people will write again and after us so it's uh, kind yeah. of liberation when you think this way. I, I completely agree. I think one of the things um, in, in my project is that there was a moment when I thought, okay, um, I'm, we're part of the um, benefit of bringing works from all over the world is that you can set the table and you lay all those things out and people can, scholars and artists and viewers and philosophers and poets can come and look at those things and they can take what they're going to take from it. And I think that this book is going to serve that purpose. It's a kind of like a, you've, you've kind of, um, it's like the spark that's going to start the fire, that's going to um, make a whole other set of scholarship and um, other art. And so I think that, that that's one of the amazing things about this volume that we should be all so grateful to the three of you for. Um, and then I think the second thing for me in terms of the difficulty is back to how you started uh, this evening, which is close looking. Is it, I, I just think if we can sit in front of these things and really look closely and with the partnership of our beloved conservators and really look at these things, we can, I mean, that's really, um, I think, where you can kind of where um, and you're never going to beat the difficulty or the challenge, but you can you can make some headway in in understanding and and so I'm going to use that as a as a kind of segue um, to this to the um, the very beautiful close looking in this catalog because one of again a, another pleasure of it is the um, most of the authors begin their essays um, 
by inviting you into the painting or into the watercolor and take you on a kind of visual journey before they begin their kind of analysis or the history of the picture. And it's, it's so generous, it's so welcoming. Um, so I, I'm wondering if we can do a little bit of that um, tonight. Maybe we can um, put up a work or two and have um, these three talk about, um, do some of that analysis for you all, how they, how they approach these works. So um, maybe, um, should we start um, maybe with boy with red vest? If we can, if we can call that up from the from the booth, and maybe um, that was one of the works that that Andre wrote about, and um, its companion painting is at the Museum of Modern Art. So it's a it's a work that I, I love very much. Yeah, there um, there he is. Um, yes, this is this is a work I uh, I. I chose to um, uh, write about myself. It was a, it was a pleasure to uh, uh, to assign these works to others. Yeah, it, it felt very nice to hand over the work, you know, rather than uh, rather than um, write them myself. But um, that one, um, I, I chose to work on um, uh, myself. So I, I started with again, like Jody said, right, uh, with the with a close look, and I think some of our mandates actually to the authors were to to combine a couple of different things in an essay: right? close looking, the collecting history, uh, the history of interpretation for each object. Where we did give them a little bit of um, a roadmap. So for uh, and and for this painting, I wanted to get something that I think is deeply profound about Cezanne just right, and that is the mix of um, uh, of of painterliness and paintedness of a figure who is there as a, a weird, strange, painted presence, right? And I, and I wanted to articulate um, uh, uh, those features of his strange face, of the uh, expression that it has, that weird cut of his, uh, a part of his hair, the, the way in which this figure is endlessly pressed into formal um, uh, uh, requirements, how that dark brown uh, line above the scaffolding is, is holding his head in place. Um, uh, all those features, I think, Need it, uh, need it saying first. Then, and this is where I think my particular angle of scholarship then uh, then comes in. And this is not true for uh, for all the essays. Um, I, uh, I I think art history can sometimes uh, luxuriate a little bit too long in in visual looking, and and to me that can sometimes uh, end up. Uh, fetishizing the art object just a, a little bit too much if you if you um, stay there um, uh, over page and page and page. So I wanted to find out eventually, you know, uh, not just who is this figure who is on the other end of that act of portrayal, right? Who is in that painting? And we actually through some. Um, uh, a scholarship that an, an Italian scholar has done about uh, the various Italian models who uh, uh, practiced in uh, Paris. We actually um, have a concrete name and we know his age now. Um, uh, and, and so all that information was there. So I, I, I then thought, okay, I'm going to give this character just a little bit more voice and on the opposite end of uh, of this exchange between the two, because so often it ends up about Cezanne and Cezanne uh, making an object and a painting. Um, and, and then I thought, who in um, uh, the uh, 1880s is wearing a freaking red vest, right? Who would do that? <laughs> um, uh, uh, I would do that. I, I probably, hey, you know, fun thing to wear, you know, and then uh, a, a blue cravat with that, you know, this is, I thought, this is an outfit. This is not um, somebody dressing for the day. This is an outfit. Okay, what do we do with that then, right? And so um, I started looking and it actually turns out, you know, and from the earliest sort of cataloging of this picture, he's always known as an Italian boy uh, with an Italian outfit. Well, what does that actually mean? So I, I found some prints from the early 19th century where precisely this outfit um, is, uh, is uh, depicted. And it's a Roman early 19th century um, uh, 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 outfit. So, so there's a little bit of contextual history that I wanted to bring to this dress. Then it turns out that the red vest is a kind of icon of romantic uh, self-expression, right? There are stories of the romantic writers going to the theater in red vests and so on. So it has this rom very romantic heritage in opposition to kind of gray 
drab bourgeois dress. So I, I, I then, so I took this as a picture and, and as a formal proposition, as a picture and as a, uh, as an, uh, a portrait, but then wanted also to, to excavate some of the social meanings that uh, this choice of figure, this choice of dress clearly had and, and get the combination of those two just right, because to me that is Cezanne, and, uh, a grabbing of social details that are then turned into these really um, strong and powerful forms. Right? And, but that balance, I think I really wanted to struck right in that entry. Should we, should, should we move to the card players for Nancy? And uh, yeah, just that's a wonderful, as we were waiting for the slide, just, just wonderful to think about the way Cezanne was an artist who responded to his own day. And, it, and often we don't, it's not something that I think maybe Barnes talked about so much or, or scholarship in general has talked about so much. Just before we, we leap into the card players, um, if I can pass the Robin and, and um, um, and I, earlier in the booth, I think we have a lovely picture of Joe Rischel in the studio at the Barnes with Sylvie having a look at it. Maybe we could find that because it's just such a nice picture. And and actually, what I want to um, yeah really single out is that methodology, the, the me methodology of methodology. Thank you <laughs> of of close looking, which was really at the heart of the project at its conception. Um, you know, that wonder of actually being able to be with the objects and so many of the authors did come to the barns and they really spent time with the works and that was something that you just, you know, there aren't many places you could do that. So it's another reason why this is a really special place to be and a very special place to to look at pictures. Um, I don't, I don't think we found that one yet, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Too bad. Well, trust me, it's a wonderful picture and we will share it with you at some point <laughs> to be continued. Um, but what I do want to bring out um, at this moment um, is how, you know, they'll took place in our conservation studios. Um, and Barbara Buckley and Anya Shutova really deserve a huge amount of praise because what we've learned about Cezanne technically in this project really changes the field and that's not an exaggeration um, because there are so many works at the barns there have been technical studies done on Cezanne many many times uh, and actually this is a wonderful moment to bring this in because the card players for an exhibition at the Courtauld Gallery which we sort of touched on um, that I was involved in myself uh, you know Charlotte Hale, Aviva Bernstock, uh, many people contributed to that project and looked at versions of the card players in different places. Now, at that time, it was relatively difficult to actually learn about works in the Barnes collection. Um, yeah, that project was in 2010, so before Barnes came to the Parkway. And so although the authors for the catalogue in 2010 could speculate about the card players and where it came within the sequence. We know that in the 1890s, Cezanne was really pre preoccupied with this topic. And Andre and I have you know, lots of thoughts about why that is. And, and please read the, read the essay to kind of dig out those meanings. Um, but what was really exciting and new in this instance is um, not only could we elaborate on that meaning, um, and again, Andre talks really cleverly about print culture and, and how that that in you know that sort of works into the into the topic but we could look at the underdrawing we could look at the changes that Barnes makes to the composition um, and we know that the figure in the center was originally wearing a hat yes yeah? so, so you start to see these things through the kinds of imaging that haven't been done in the past so you're starting to to build up um, a much broader picture of Cezanne as a practitioner. Um, you know, other things that came out through this process is that we understood how erratic Cezanne is. Um, you know, some works have underdrawing, some works have barely no underdrawing. Uh, so there's no consistent way of, of him working. Um, you know, and sometimes he'll add extra bits of canvas to a work, um, like in the Allier Marine. So it's, 
it's just so interesting to to bring this to the forefront and and the conservation staff really deserve a huge amount of praise for for bringing that because you might just sort of think of it as a slim essay in the volume but it's it's packed with info <laughs> um yeah and it really the, the volume really does um reflect that back and forth and the, the, those technical discoveries and um really exciting to see this kind of thing those x-rays and and um you know and, and you really um you almost feel like you're in the lab um so that's uh, that's that's very special so so there we have the um uh, one of the examples of the little alteration so on later in the swan uh, he opened out the what we call the tacking margin so the sort of edge of the canvas just to sort of make it a little bit bigger on the left so there's lots of little glimpses like that into into what he was doing what about you sylvie can we can we bring up the um the bathers in repose um yes these are the questions. Yeah. So I, I was I was allocated. I mean, this work was assigned to me at the very very first beginning of the project by Joe. I don't know if it was a consolation prize, but he told me you should write on these pictures. Uh, it's because I mean, this picture used to um, belong to Gustave Caillebot, and it was offered to the French uh, museums um, at the end of the 19th century. And uh, a part of the collection was accepted by the curators at the time but some pictures were rejected and among them there was this one. So every time I was, when I was at the bounce, every time I said, oh, it should be at the Orsay. But I mean, the, the story ended well because it's at the bounce. He purchased it in 1932. So I, I had the great pleasure of working of this, on this picture with, um, uh, with Chris Riopel, a great friend from, I mean, from Philadelphia and from London. Um, and I think that what we wanted to, to address in this uh, essay entry, uh, to go back to the fact that we wanted to have, um, you know, uh, different voices in the catalogue, etc. And I think that with this very specific work, uh, what we wanted to um, to convey is, uh, of course, is the complexities, mystery, and how open uh, a picture by Cezanne uh, can be. So, uh, uh, what we try to figure out is what are you looking at when you look at such a picture? I mean, it's bases, of course. It's traditionally we say that it's a kind of recollection of uh, uh, of um, Cezanne when he was younger, when he was uh, going to the countryside with uh, Emile Zola and, you know, um, uh, take baths. But I mean, it's uh, it, it was painted 20 years after uh, uh, this um, uh, um, uh, sortie with uh, Zola uh, took place. So is it an opener scene? Is it a recollection? Is it a reconstruction? And what we did also in the, in the entry is really to um, to determine, I mean, to, to find uh, all the um, uh, inspiration, the sources that were mobilized by uh, Cézanne when he was painting uh, these bases at rest. Uh, so he looked at uh, old masters, he looked at uh, sculpture, and there is a really interesting um, dialogue between, uh, you know, the flatness of the painting and all the sculptures he was referring to. So is it a kind of collage of museum references? Um, is it, I mean, are there male bathers, female bathers at some point? I mean, you can't really identify the gender of the models and to to go back to uh, Andre's point with uh, uh, the young bo boy with the red vest, I mean, who are there? I mean, they are not bourgeois, uh, at, you know, uh, during a leisure moment. I mean, the body are, their bodies are much more like uh, workers' bodies. I mean, so I think that what we wanted to convey uh, uh, working on this uh, work is really how, I mean, puzzling and disorientating is it, it is even now. I mean, and it's also one of the very, very rare uh, works that uh, Cézanne decided to display, to uh, show publicly uh, before 1895, before this uh, great exhibition at Vola. Uh, he showed very few works, and this one was uh, exhibited in 1877 in Paris 
And I mean, it was completely uh, misunderstood, laughed at. I mean, people really rejected uh, very strongly this picture. So it's also interesting in terms of reception. And even if we are no lo longer shocked by uh, the painting, I think we are still really, um, yes, I mean, disoriented by what it means and what is, you know, at play uh, in, in, in this work. Yeah, I think that that word disorienting is perfect and it's, it's such a fabulous and complex and rich thing. Um, um, and the, you, you raise this idea about reception and so um, it, it, it makes me want to raise this question to all of you, which is that this is um, your book comes out at a moment where there's been a kind of resurgence in exhibitions and other projects about Cezanne. Um, certainly our, our project on drawings to the Museum of Modern Art, but that followed um, a host of um, other things in, in Europe and, and a retrospective to come. And so I'm just wondering um, this question, how, how can we make Cezanne relevant to our current moment in art history and museum culture? How can we come up with a 21st century way of looking at Cezanne? Was that something that was in your mind? Like the kind of why now, why publish this book now kind of question. I know that's a hard one. Does anyone have a, want to start us off? <laughs> okay, um, I'll take it. Um, it Jody, lovely question. Um, Yes, absolutely. It, it, it does strike me, and I, I'm, I'm sure everyone on the stage, that it is that this, these are kind of really Cezanne years. You know, with your amazing show, publication of this book, the uh, the, the big retrospective that's coming up uh, next uh, uh, next summer in Chicago and in in London. So there, uh, and and many other uh, projects as well. So, um, and and what I have noticed. Uh, in uh, as a slight sort of redirection of how we look at Cezanne is, uh, I think that was very clear in your show and it's very clear in this book certainly is that um, that material honing in into process and material transformation, the kind, the kind of really deep look into, uh, into an object, right? And I think there Cezanne can really help us um, uh, exemplify somebody who in his day just didn't take the the visual world and the world of the spectacle for granted. You know, wasn't scrolling past something uh, endlessly, but uh, but but really wanted to dig into the properties and the meanings of of uh, of the stuff of the world. And the pictures are just full of that endlessly. And and I think this moment in art history, through technical analysis, close looking and so on, really actually takes that challenge in Cezanne seriously. And I think that's why people are coming, right? Because of that sustained, really deep um, uh, encounter with, uh, with materials and, and with the world. Um, uh, for me, in the other way to, to make Cezanne relevant um, is a little bit more, um, you know, my bailiwick, I'll be very frank, uh, uh, really um, uh, getting away from some of those 20th century fixations on Cezanne as the originator of X and the, uh, and the father of this and that. Uh, 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 I think the, the moment for all of that kind of canon building to me is hopefully uh, uh, more or less over. And instead, I really wished it um, that we were more often looking at, um, at a Cezanne that does have uh, something to say about the social and not just about uh, form, right? I think an, 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 an exhibition about Cezanne in X that actually takes all the various class positions, the workers next to the lady in blue, and, and a really careful excavation of what Cezanne actually sees uh, is going on um, uh, culturally in his environment, um, I, I think it, it would be amazing. And, and part of this, I think the Chicago and London versions um, uh, of the uh, retrospective are, are going to do. I think they're going to do something very exciting as far as I know. Uh, they've invited 10 contemporary artists to respond to Cezanne, and that's going to be uh, largely what their catalog is going to do. And, and obviously when that happens, uh, so many other interesting things are can all of a sudden be seen in Cezanne, right? I think there's going to be a big section on um, uh, on uh, the model uh, Scipio, uh, who he painted in the 1860s, who was a model of African descent, who Cezanne shows from uh, the back with uh, uh, almost wounds on his back um, uh, that are that, that the painting process is almost 
Laurence brought about. So there, there are, uh, I think, whole layers of Cezanne um, that, that I think 20th century modernist art history and exhibition making has just never really confronted. And maybe uh, this is the moment when um, I'm hoping that, that that could be done a little bit more. And, and I think Cezanne completely lends itself to, um, to both, I think, those avenues of, of inquiry. But that is just me. Um, that's, a, that's a wonderful answer, Andre. I, I think too, and it's something we've touched on this evening is this idea of, of not being the last word. And, and I think particularly for, you know, for us internally at the Barnes, for people that work at the Barnes who, who love the Barnes, the book also functions um, in an educational sense. Um, it is a, it's a wonderful place to learn more about works that, that haven't always been written about to a great extent. And that in turn feeds into our classes, it, it feeds into our work in communities, you know, with schools groups coming in. And some of this is a slow burn, <laughs> you know, when these 21st perspectives, 21st century perspectives on the artist emerge, you know, maybe this is in 20 years, 30 years time, but it's, you need the tools to do that with. And so, you know, I think this book, an exhibition like the one that Jody's just, just done, you know, all of this, um, you know, just really helps keep the work top of mind. Um, because, you know, again, we need to see these things in order to be thinking about them. <laughs> so, so it really is the visibility piece too. I think that that um, mention of community and the people who are gonna learn so much from this book is a perfect segue to turning, um, the podium over to you all and we're hoping that you have questions um, for our panel and um, and I know there'll be some questions coming in virtually as well. So um, for those in the room, there's a microphone that's going to be passed around and that's um, I Hi, Jody. important. Oh, I see there's a question up there. Yeah, I have a question before we see if there's any in the room. Uh, Amy asks, uh, what insights from the collaboration do you think you might apply to future work? Sorry, did, I think we missed that last bit. What insights from this collaboration do you think you might apply to your future work? So what insights from this can we apply to other projects? Well, maybe Val, I don't know if they have some, something that, that impacted Valadon since that wonderful <laughs> exhibition is just right upstairs. Um, I think that it, uh, and maybe again, I speak for, to Sylvia and Andre, is that it reminds us how you are constantly surprised. You think you know an artist and there's always something that you've missed or something that you see differently. So it's a good reminder not to be complacent. <laughs> And, and I think it also just, um, it helps us to, to be really thoughtful about making. And that is something that, um, you know, again, it, looking at our future projects moving forward, we're really interested in conservation research. How does that shape our vision of, of an artist? Um, you know, how do we think of artists as practitioners? So I think for me, that, that's something that I'm, you know, it was something I knew that I liked, but I, I'm really, you know, much more committed to that through this work. Just speak into this one. Um, question for Andre and maybe others. Uh, um, I think of uh, Barnes's uh, own aesthetic or interest is more formalist in, in art. And I'm wondering, what you would speculate to be his reaction to your uh, and other interpretations that are that focus on social meanings and, and, a, and a broader uh, context to the work. I know it's pure speculation, but I invite you to speculate. <laughs> okay, thank you. Then I'll do that. Um, uh, yeah, I think there are definitely aspects of this volume where Dr. Barnes would say, hmm. um, or even no. 
um, uh, I, I wouldn't be so but but I think that's okay you know I, I think uh, scholarship needs to evolve and needs to change and and um, and and then needs to move in a variety uh, of directions what I will say though and and maybe this is one of the bigger lessons for me from this from this book that that Barnes and formalism uh, has come to mean a whole bunch of new, really wonderful things to me, right? And and actually, I think that the, there can be a kind of patness in that in 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 that formulation that to me just closes down so many things that are actually interesting and socio historical about formalism. And I think the the whole collection history and the purchase history is actually a social history of a formalist approach, right? So. A, the, the, the book brings those two together in really interesting ways. Secondly, as I, as I said earlier, I think even though Barnes was interested in form, in the profundity of form, um, that that does not exclude the fact that his language was endlessly evocative and 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 and, and, and his writing is a social practice right and 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 um and and full of very specific references so so i think we we just mostly i just want us to to complicate that whole notion that barnes was a formalist you know what is that you know and and, and isn't that something that is in much more socially oriented than i think the, the brevity of that comment might might include. So those are just some of the thoughts that I have to that to that interesting provocation. Maybe you would have been pleased to see that we we really look close very closely to the work. So this is very balanced. I mean, at least <laughs> it's something he shares with Cezanne, of course, who also looked very closely. So there's all of those connections. There's a. I have one more question from online. Uh, there's a question of, uh, for the cover of the book, why was rocks and trees chosen for the front cover? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, and we did look at various different options. Um, you know, David, um, our director of publications, really helped steward us through that. Um, it was a, it's a difficult choice. It's always a difficult choice. And some of it is practical. You want to look at what is on, what's on the cover of other Cezanne books that are available. You know, you do want your book to, to stand out. Um, but I think this is the one that we fell on because we liked the verticality of the image. So again, you know, getting back to those actual visuals, um, it is a, it's a, it's a detail that really kind of, um, sings on, on a cover. Um, it has that wonderful uh, sense of that, you know, that faceted brushwork that we love in the artist. So there was so much that's very, um, almost kind of calling card uh, about that work. And, and you know, it's, uh, well, we were spoiled for choice, really. I mean, that was the nice, the nice part. Um, it, yeah, it, if anything, the, the choice made it hard. And it also reflects um, Barnes' taste for uh, Cezanne landscapes. So it's a kind of uh, representative of what the collection is. So there's a, a question with, yeah, in the second so row. So I prefer her, who wouldn't have been seen so easily by the Okay. Right here. Can I just speak into it? Um, I, <laughs> hello, everybody. Um, I just wanted to address something that Jody, that you asked earlier about Barnes as a collector. And as a teacher here, I just want to reiterate that he wasn't an ordinary collector. I mean, he didn't collect just to collect, and he didn't collect to sell. He collected to teach, and you know, his whole goal was to teach people how to see. And you've been talking all night about close looking, and I think. You know, going to that gentleman's um, statement or provocative question about if Barnes was alive, I actually think maybe he would have grown beyond just formalism too and begun to understand. I mean, I think he understood it anyway. I just think that's the way he preferred to look at a painting. But I think he would have been delighted in this publication and in the way you have all gone about looking at the work. I think he would have been happy. So, because anyway. it would have extended the educational project in a way, in the exactly. educational ambition. Exactly. That, that's and a, helping that's... to people, helping people to see even deeper into a work of art. 
you know, in the whole layering of Cezanne that Andre talked about. Thank you. That's, that's a really important point. Okay, I've been handed the baton. Uh, so we've talked about formalism. Uh, I'd just like to talk about a basic element to go to color. Cezanne was famous for his blue, and the, uh, I think it was Nancy brought up the lighting can vary the perception of his work. And uh, when I was at Latches Lane, or we opened the window once, and the blues and the Cezannes just jumped off the, uh, the canvas. So is there anything in the book that talks about something as simple as the interpretation you might have from the lighting that you see on a, on a work? We haven't gone so much into the specifics of um, you know, the actual light in the galleries, although some of the authors have talked about you know, placement within the ensembles. One of the things, though, that I didn't mention, which came out of the work that Barbara Buckley and Anya Shitova did, is we often associate Cezanne with blue. You know, I think we see those blue reiterated outlines and what have you, but green <laughs> was the thing that really came out. Um, Anya Shatova did this wonderful technical imaging that really shows us that, he, you know, Cezanne is using green all over his canvases, um, even, when you, when, even when it doesn't look like green. Um, and so, of course, again, that really is almost um, encouraging you to, to look more closely at what is actually there and you just haven't seen it, what's hidden in plain sight, and particularly with the, with the great bathers, which was... Yeah, you know, and there was you know sort of major conservation treatment went uh, on um, for this project, um, and we've just learned so much through that. So, um, I'm sort of, it's not exactly an answer to your question, but uh, but certainly something that actually it, I mean it does ref it is actually a question about light, because there we're looking um, in in the sorts of specialist light you can have in a conservation studio. You know what happens um, with an X-ray, um, with infrared light, with raking light. Um, and this was the opportunity to do all of that. So it's, you know, it's, it's the gallery light plus, <laughs> plus a great deal. I'd also just, just give a shout out to one of our colleagues, um, Holly Clayson, who's an um, art historian at Northwestern, who's done a really interesting project about um, the beginnings of uh, electrical illumination in the 19th century and how that changed artists' perceptions of their own work, like how lighting itself um, had an impact on what they were doing. And um, so anyway, if you're interested in that, I would look for her book. Other questions? Other questions? Up in the back? Yeah. No, I think everybody would agree that not every, uh, every painting by any artist is a masterpiece. And it sounds like there was a wealth of material available to Barnes when he started collecting in 1912. So I'm wondering what informed the way Barnes made his decisions and how do art critics and art historians look now at what Barnes collected in terms of um, what, is, uh, uh, what is the importance of those particular pieces or did idiosyncrasies of Barnes lead him to collect pieces that are not recognized as the most important ones today? I mean, I would say that, I mean, generally people agree on the quality of the collection. I mean, he made very few mistakes in a way. I mean, he had a very good eye and he was very demanding. So uh, I don't think that there is a kind of real valuation of the collection. But I mean, it's true that he, he also made very strong choices. And for instance, if some of you are really interested and passionate about uh, the young Cezanne, I mean, you will you would be disappointed at the bonds because he, knew he was not interested in, or he didn't succeed in uh, getting some, you know, uh, picture from the 1860s. I mean, he, uh, he really focused on the 1880s, 1890s. So it's also a, a really a, a vision of Cezanne. And um, he was very much, you know, a, a man of his time. Uh, André was uh, uh, mentioning that, I mean, his story of collecting was also a social history. And it's very much, I mean, it's very true for, for, for Barnes. 
Um, so, I mean, to answer your question, of course, the collection could be, you know, completed and uh, sometimes uh, he focused on works which were not uh, masterpieces, but, uh, I mean, generally speaking, I mean, the quality of his acquisitions here is really, really high. I mean, it's one of the most uh, prominent collection of Cézanne in the world. It's, uh, it's impressive. I mean, it's really impressive. Uh, Let's see, there's, <laughs> can we, okay, we're going to, we're going to call it now. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Nina Diefenbach. I'm Senior Vice President for Advancement, and I am just so thrilled to, um, and asking all of you to share your applause for this extraordinary talk. <laughs> I truly think, I hope you all feel that in a way you had the curtain drawn, if you will, so you could get a sneak into how curatorial minds work, how a publication of this magnitude comes together. It's absolutely intriguing, and I think that the many years that went into it and the deep collaboration across so many different institutions and disciplines um, and the curatorial conservation dialogue is such an important one. And I really, um, it's absolutely fascinating. And I hope those of you who are online enjoyed it as much as those of us who are in the room. Um, I would like to thank all of you, both online and in, on, in the room. You're all members of this institution. You all make this kind of project possible. You make very many other things that we do here possible, all of which feeds into creating projects like this, um, creating our exhibitions, creating our community programs, doing our outreach, creating and nurturing scholarship in all arenas. Thank you so much. This catalog, as you are not surprised to hear, is available in the shop tonight. Um, and it's online. For those of you who are online and joining us online, it's at barnesfoundation.org. Um, it would be a lovely holiday present, wouldn't it? <laughs> Um, but I just um, can't thank you all enough for joining us. And for those of you who are here, do join us upstairs um, for the Circle Soiree. And I, I just, um, what a treat. Give another round of applause. <laughs>